Thank, thank you very much, Graham. So this evening we're on to Ezra chapter one. We finally got to Ezra chapter one. And so uh, I think you'd find it helpful if you turn there. And let me just find my notes. Oh, look at that. So we're doing the redemption of the remnant. And this is part five, Ezra chapter one. And we just, just get to dip in very briefly to Ezra two. But first, let me do a bit of recap. Uh, in the previous sessions, we saw the Lord's foreknowledge, his predestination, his planning, his prophesying, and actions in his dealings with the nation of Israel. He judged Israel to punish them, but also to bring them to repentance. He, he prophesied, the Lord prophesied that Babylon would fall and that Persian King Cyrus would be the one to bring that fall about. The Lord spoke of what I called his long-term plan, so that this was way beyond the return of the exiles to Israel and the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple. It was to do with the coming of the Messiah and God coming into his real temple by his spirit into his church, his new covenant church, and it's to do with the new, the new covenant. Then last time we took an overview of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah really one book and saw that although the Lord was speaking such great positive and glorious things through the contemporary prophets, that's through Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. In an oversense, what was being experienced by, by the people as recorded in Ezra and Nehemiah was failure. There was, there was no glory in the completed temple. The people still failed to, to keep the Lord's commandments and so on. So in all the previous sessions, we've really been doing overview. And now we're going to start focusing in on some things in detail, some things, we can't do everything. I don't know if you remember this. This is something I showed you, but this is now the same thing, but backwards. So this is, this is an overview of the earth. And then as we focus in, you've got the mountains. And as we keep going down, I know it's a bit of a fiddle, but uh, uh, we see things more clearly. And somewhere just down there over the precipice there, there's a, there's a house sitting in the mountain. And then you can start to see all the detail. There's people here and there's this thing. I don't know what that is, but we could investigate and whatever this flag is, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is what we're going to do now. Look at, look at some detail. So the, 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 the overall gives us, sorry, the overview gives us context so that we can better understand the detail, I believe. Then maybe we, we won't get lost in, in the forest. Uh, I not as that, as that saying is now be, uh, not being able to see the wood for the trees. So that's what we're doing today. So here's here's a few dates to remind us. I've spent you know all these dates off by heart by now. I'm not going to read them all out. Seven one twelve, six oh five, and so on. And uh, Cy Cyrus is the Persian king at this time. And so we're up to here. Five three nine BC, Cyrus conquers Babylon. The fall of Babylon. I bet you've got that one fixed in your brains now. And then 536, 535 BC, the, Germans, the, the Jews return to Jerusalem uh, with Zerubbabel and company and, and so on. So, um, okay. So we saw, as already mentioned in session two, how just as the Lord had predicted, the fall of Babylon came through Cyrus, uh, in, as it says here, in about 712 BC, about 150 years before the event Isaiah had prophesied about Cyrus. So we looked at some of that, but we didn't actually look at it all. And I actually missed out this particular verse. This is Isaiah 45, 13. It says, I've raised him up. This is it's talking about Cyrus. I remember 150 years before he was doing all this stuff. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. So the, the, the blue bits there 
are the most relevant bits. He shall build my city. Um, the Lord is very precise in his prophecy and prediction. And let my exiles go free. So Cyrus, God's shepherd, you remember in Isaiah 44, he was called God's shepherd. He issued the decree recorded in, in Ezra 1 and at the end of 2 Chronicles 36. So here it is. Now in the first year of King of Cyrus, king of Persia, this is the, the, the very last chapter, 2 Chronicles 36, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And as I'm sure you know, this is exactly the same as the first few verses of Ezra chapter 1, except that verse 3, this is Ezra chapter 1, 1 to 3, but verse 3 continues. It says, let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, etc. Apart from that, it's, this, it's exactly the same. And this, this passage, 2 Chronicles 36, is the very last chapter, as Chris pointed out a few weeks ago, the very last chapter of the Jewish Old Testament, the Tanakh, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, the Tanakh, Tanakh, Tanakh. And so the, the Jewish Old, the Hebrews Old Testament has all the same words as the Christian Old Testament, but um, it's just that the books are in a different order. I've got someone making notes on my screen, yeah, trying to help me out, I think. But, uh, <clears throat> but once again, as we saw with Nabonidus and Belshazzar, once again, the experts questioned this because they argued that a king of that time, that age, uh, a despotic king, as he has been described, Cyrus, of that age would not allow foreign slaves to return to their own lands. It's just not what they used to do. But then in 1879, the Cyrus cylinder was discovered in Babylon. Now, this is, this is a very exciting thing. And uh, it's now kept in the British Museum. That's one of the reasons it, it's exciting. It's just up the road from us. I don't know how many people here have been to stand in front of it. I've been up there several times and just stood in front of it. Sorry about that. But uh, it's, it's, it's considered to be, that I'm quoting from the, the, the book I showed you the other week, which is, I've forgotten the name, but it's the, what's it called? Through, oh yes, through the British Museum with the Bible, something like that. And it's, it, is, it is considered to be one of the most significant documents of the Persian Empire. It proclaims that King Cyrus of Persia allowed exiles taken captive during the Babylonian Empire to return to their own country and rebuild their temples, taking their gods with them. So the experts who said that it's not possible that the Bible could be true uh, in this section were, were completely wrong. And this, this was the proof of it. And today it's considered so important because it's, it's thought to be the, um, one of the, or the earliest statement of, of human rights. Um, it's so important that there's a copy of this. The original is in the British Museum. We've got it just down the road here. But there's a copy of this, and it, a, a pretty exact copy, in the United Nations building in, in New York. And in 1971, it was translated into all the official, uh, official United Nations languages. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a tra well, I, I, I just like it. Uh, but for us, of course, it's important because it gives independent witness to the words of scripture. Not that we need, it's not necessary for us to have that independent witness in order to know that the Bible is true. If we're born again, the, the Holy Spirit will teach us that the Bible is true. That's one of the things he does. Then we have a choice. We can choose to believe the book or, or not believe it. Uh, but obviously, uh, if we're wise, we will choose to believe the book and stand on that. 
but um, here's a, yeah, there it is in the in the British Museum, and it's, a, it's it's sort of in the middle, but it's in its own glass cage with nothing else much ar around. And um, but uh, but all these confirmation confirmations, of course, are wonderful bonuses. And as I said before, the British Museum is full of this sort of stuff. So some people believe that Daniel, who got on well with Cyrus, may have influenced Cyrus in, in this decision to, to let the captives go, in particular, the, the Jews. Uh, the scripture doesn't say that, but it's certainly a possibility. So in, uh, this is Daniel 6, verse 28. So you remember Daniel 6 is the chapter about Daniel in the, in the lion's den. And Darius is the king, or at least someone called Darius, that, that Daniel calls Darius is the king. It's actually Cyrus. Um, I'm not going to go through all that again. And this is what verse 28 says. Uh, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persia. Or uh, you can be translated like this. this. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius even in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. I think that's probably a better translation. Um, so it's clear that uh, Daniel and, and Cyrus got on somehow. Daniel was prospering in his reign and so on. So whether he did teach Cyrus or not, the, the fact is that, that, that Cyrus did exactly what God had said he would do long before he was born, as, as we read in previously in Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45. And of course, we do also know that, that Daniel was in communication with the Lord about all of this sort of thing. And, but as we look through and, and uh, Ezra chapter one, and we see what Cyrus actually did, it made me ask the question, how did Cyrus know these things that he says and it may well be that the, the answer is Daniel taught him. So, Ezra chapter one, verse one, we're going to go through it verse by verse. So I'm just, I'm not going to read the whole lot, then come back, we're just going to go verse by verse. So this is the same as we've just read in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of the king of Persia so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, but we're not going to read verse 2 yet. So this, this, this is just statements of some facts. Uh, in his first year, Cyrus gave a, a command that Jews should return from Babylon to Jerusalem and that Jeru the Jerusalem temple should be uh, rebuilt. Uh, now, in the first year of Cyrus, King of Persia clearly refers to the first year that he ruled Babylon. That is 539 BC, not the first year that he became the Medo-Persian king. That, if you remember, the, I'm sure you've all learned those dates I've sent out. Uh, he, he became the king of the, Medo, Med, Med, uh, the Medes and the Persians in 559 BC, 20 years before. I just wanted to diverge a little bit and, and talk a little bit about Bible years um, because they can be a little bit tricky and they can trip you up if you're not careful. So I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a point about Bible dates, but more importantly about Bible accuracy and exactness. Because for example, this is what this reminded me of it. Daniel chapter one, verse one, I'm sure you know what this says. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So we're off topic now. We're not talking about Ezra. I'm just, I'm just want to make a point about these sorts of statements in the in the third year. But this this was in 605 BC, as we know, the year that Nebuchadnezzar ascended to the throne, and Nebuchadnezzar uh, defeated Jehoiakim and Jerusalem and took Daniel and company to Babylon, as we've said before. But when you read um, this comments in Jeremiah 25, one to two, it says, 
the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. But the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was 605 BC, which, according to Daniel, was the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And yet Jeremiah says it happened in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, uh, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Um, it says Jeremiah spoke to all the people. And then it, it, it sort of it, it compounds this point later on in verse 8. It says, when Jeremiah says that, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will future send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar the king, my servant, and will bring them against this land. So um, <clears throat> he's he he's speaking about something uh, uh, future, if if you like, um, as if it hasn't happened. Um, but this was in Jehoiakim's fourth year. So how can it not have happened in his fourth year if it actually happened in his third year? Do you see the 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 problem? Oh, we got a. Hang on a minute. That's it. So, um, is it is it just a straight contradiction? Is it a Bible error? Well, actually, it isn't at all. It actually shows the opposite. It it, it shows how accurate the the Bible is. So I'm going to try and explain why. The thing is that the the book of Daniel is obviously a Jewish book, but it's also a Babylonian book. Daniel, Daniel spent most of his his life in, in Babylon. So it uses the, the Babylonian conventions for dates. But Jeremiah was a Jewish prophet living in Judah, and he uses the Hebrew, the Jewish conventions for dates. So in the Babylonian system, the first full year of a king's reign began on New Year's Day after the king's uh, accession to the, to the throne. So if King Jehoiakim became king in 608 BC, even if it was uh, in our date system, January 608 BC, under the Babylonian system, his reign would be dated as starting on the 1st of January 607 BC. We'd be doing BC, so that is actually a year later. Do you see what I'm saying? But the Jews counted king's years like us. So if he'd, uh, if the king had ascended in, the, uh, in January, 608 that would be his first year according to the jewish system so Je Je jehoiakim's fourth year under the jewish system was his third year under the babylonian system the thing is i don't know i don't know if i'm the only person who comes across these things in the bible and i think wait a minute it says in you know you get to jeremiah 25 and you think wait a minute it says in daniel chapter 1 verse 1 that it was the third year and then you think and now it says it's the fourth year but it's not a discrepancy. It's actually showing how accurate and exact the, 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 the Bible is. Uh, the Bible reflects all the conventions of the, the day. And as I say, it's accurate and exact, as you would expect for a book which is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. That's tremendous, isn't it? And, of course, Jesus called scripture the word of God. So we'd, we'd expect it to be exact. Now, all that is a bit of a side. I hope, I hope it is of some benefit to some people. Right, so back to Ezra 1 verse 1. So it says, talks here about that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. So which word of the Lord? Of course, the, the, the message that comes to mind is the, is the 70 years prophecy. And but there, there are others as well. Here's, here's another one. This one is Jeremiah 51. Again, we looked at Jeremiah 51 and 52, is it, or 50 and, 50 and 51, isn't it? Before, where there's all these prophecies about um, the Medes conquering um, Babylon. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I didn't write it down. I'll have to read it, Joe. I've got it written down here. This is Jeremiah 51, 11. Sharpen the arrows, take up the shields, 
and cover yourselves. The Lord has stirred up the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his purpose concerning Babylon is to destroy it. For that is the vengeance of the Lord, vengeance on Babylon for plundering and destroying his temple. So you've got this idea of the Lord stirring up the spirit of Cyrus in Ezra chapter one, and you've got the idea that Jeremiah had prophesied it some years before. So Cyrus gave the decree in his first year. It was one of the first things he did. So why, why was it that was one of the first things he did? It was because it says here, the Lord had stirred his spirit to do it. Praise God. It was the Lord who, who did it. He stirred up the spirit of Cyrus so that he made the proclamation throughout all his kingdom. He wanted to make sure everyone knew and he put it in writing and we actually have a record of the official administrative type of version of this in Ezra chapter 6 but we're not going to look at that today it's not the same wording of this it's, it's much more formal and official so in verse 2 it's this is what he said thus says Cyrus king of Persia all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So Cyrus understands that the Lord, that is Yahweh, um, I can't do the proper pronunciation, but Yahweh is the I am, the, the eternal God, you know, the I am who met Moses, um, spoke to Moses. Uh, he, but, it, but what it says here that Cyrus understands that, that, that Yahweh is the God of heaven. Um, somehow God revealed himself uh, as Yahweh, as I said, in the, in the burning bush. And Yahweh was, of course, the name that the, the Jews found too holy to utter. They wouldn't use the, the name Yahweh. But, but Cyrus no, knows he is God. And that he is, uh, <clears throat> that, that Cyrus also understands, according to this scripture, that it is, it is God who has given him his kingdom. And of course, that, that is a major theme of the book of Daniel, perhaps the major theme of the book of Daniel. Again, let, I don't think I've written this one down, but let me quote you Daniel 4, verse 17. This is Daniel 4, 17, where uh, it says, the most high rules in the kingdom of men and he, he gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. It's interesting that he sets over it the lowest of men, isn't it? But uh, the point is, God gives the, 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 the kingdom of men, the kingdoms of men, to who, whomever he desires to set up. It's an astonishing thought, isn't it? But we won't go into that. So thirdly here, Cyrus knows that the Lord, Yahweh, has appointed him to build him a house at Jerusalem. In fact, he says the Lord has commanded him to build that house. So how, how did he know that? I wonder if Daniel showed it to him in Isaiah 44 and uh, 45. So verse 3. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up. And that's where 2 Chronicles 36 finishes. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus exhorts, he, he commands actually, the Jews to leave their place and to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the house of the Lord, the house of uh, Yahweh. He says Yahweh is the God of Israel, and he, he is God who's in Jerusalem. Cyrus knows that Israel is, is, is the eternal God's covenant people, not the Persians uh, or the Medes or the Babylonians. He knows that Israel is, is God's people. And he look, look here, he says, the Lord God of Israel, he is God. He emphasizes that he is God. That is, that is the word Elohim in the beginning. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That's the same uh, word. And um, he knows that Yahweh has put his name in Jerusalem. 
Uh, how does he know this? Uh, we, we don't know for sure. Maybe Daniel taught him, but somehow God taught him. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? That God is well able to teach people one way or another. And that's what the, that's what the Lord does. He's a God who re reveals himself to people. He especially teaches those who've got hungry hearts. He's found of those who search for him with all their hearts. Praise God. This is verse four. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So uh, Cyrus exhorts any Jews who are left behind in any place um, uh, <coughs> that they should be helped by the Gentiles. Now, there's some debate about whether he's, he's asking Gentiles to help them or to, he's asking Jews who, who, who won't go up to Jerusalem to help. Uh, that, whichever, that's what's being asked. And, and then he talks about free, free will offerings here for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, you remember when the Lord commanded Moses to make the tabernacle, here it is, Exodus 25, verse 1 to 9. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly. With his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze. And it carries on. I'm going to skip up to verse 8. And down here somewhere, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings. Just show uh, you shall make it. So somehow Cyrus also knew that God's dwelling place on earth was connected to free will offering. There's no compulsion. This is what God said to the Israelites in the wilderness. He said, bring me an offering willingly. And from that, make me a sanctuary. Uh, there's calling. There's, there's God's drawing. There's his plan, but no compulsion. To be part of his sanctuary uh, is, to, is to come and offer oneself freely. Praise God. So just these first four verses in Ezra, causes me to conclude a number of things and the, and 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 the the main one is that it turns out that cyrus knows everything he knows about god about the jews about jerusalem the temple the offerings and so on he knows he knows it all from scripture he's got it all from scripture he's he's right on the ball to do with scripture as we said maybe daniel taught him we don't know it seems quite likely to me but one way or another, Cyrus knew something of Scripture. And God has given Scripture to teach us, to teach all of us, to teach the whole world what we need to know. There, there are many, many other things that we can know, and many of them are very, very interesting, and some of them may be essential to us for our jobs and, and so on. But what we need to know, what we must know, is in the, is in the Scripture. And... I believe as we apply ourselves to scripture, God will teach us. Blessed is the person who soaks themselves in the, the scripture. Of course, the scripture is not an end in, in itself. The scripture is to bring us to God himself. And that is what it will always do to those who have hungry hearts. Um, and then history, I, the, the, the Cyrus Cylinder and so on, also teaches us that, that Cyrus was benevolent, not just to the Jews, but to, to all the peoples that Nebuchadnezzar had captured and exiled to Babylon. He sent them home and he allowed them to worship their own gods. He believed in freedom of religion. Here are just, uh, I don't know if I'll read it all, but there's just a few excerpts um, from the Cyrus Cylinder translation of. He says, I returned the images of the gods who had resided there to their places, and I let them dwell in eternal abodes. I gathered all their inhabitants and returned to them their dwellings. 
In addition, at the command of Marduk, the great lord, I settled in their habitations. Now, Marduk is the chief god of the Babylonians. That's not Yahweh. <laughs> this is the chief god of the Bab Babylonians, if you remember. He says, in pleasing abodes, the gods of Sumer and a Akkad, whom Nabonidus, to the anger of the lord of the gods, had brought into Babylon. If you remember, Nabonidus, who was the last king of Babylon, Elshazzar's father, he was not a serious Marduk worshipper. And that is why one of the reasons why he was out of favor with the Babylonian people. But it turns out that Cyrus was a serious Marduk worshipper. Despite what we read about him knowing scripture and so on. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? So he was a serious Marduk worshipper. And that's one of the reasons why the, the, the Babylonian people liked Cyrus. And as we said before, they, they actually, some of them welcomed, them welcomed him into Babylon with open arms. And it says 34 there. This is Cyrus's prayer. May all the gods whom I settled in their sacred centers ask daily, of Baal and Nabu, that my days be long, and may they intercede for my welfare. May they say to Marduk, my lord, keeps mentioning Marduk, as to Cyrus the king who reveres you, and Cambyses his son, that's the son of Cyrus, and so on. That's all I copied. So it seems to me that this seems to show that Cyrus was a, Cyrus was a Marduk worshipper, not a, a worshipper of Yahweh, despite what uh, what he knew of Yahweh. Right, verse 5, that we're up to Ezra 5 now. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to, to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. That's tremendous. So God moved their spirits. God moved the spirit of Cyrus. Now God moves the spirits of the Jews. But it was, it was they themselves who, who got up and went. The, the initiative is from God, but they have to uh, respond. They went to make the dwelling place of God. The word of God comes to us. Then we have to make a response. We have to take action. We have to change our lives in some way to conform to him and his will. Right, this is verse 6 to 7. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. Of course, they had been commanded by Cyrus to do that. Right, verse 7. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. And so God gave the Jews favor with the people and with Cyrus. Uh, it's, remember, in the same way that when the Israelites left Egypt, God gave them favor with the Egyptians and they, they came out with a lot of stuff. Right, verse 8. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Shesh Bazar, the prince of Judah. So Mithridath comes again in um, Ezra, chapter 4, verse 7, but it's not the same person. It's two different people, but with the same name. This is Mithridath, the treasurer of uh, Persia. And the thing is that there are lots of names in Ezra and Nehemiah, and you find this sort of thing, I'm sure you realize, ha happens quite a lot. You'll get a familiar name in lists of names, but... We mustn't always assume it's the it's the famous person of that name. For example, if you've got your Bible, if you look at uh, Ezra chapter 2, verse 2, it says that those who came with Zerubbabel were Jeshua or Joshua, Nehemiah. Well, that's not the famous Nehemiah of the book Nehemiah, because Nehemiah was not around at this time. And then it says, Sarea Realia Mordecai. Again, that's not the famous Mordecai, who was uh, Esther's uncle, is it? Um, although I, I did read one comment, one person who thought it was the same, but I, I can't see how it can be. Uh, but there you go. So now then you've got this person here, Sheshbazar. He counted them out to Sheshbazar, the, the prince of Judah. So, so who is Sheshbazar? Some say that Sheshbazar is Zerubbabel. 
some say not. So it's not actually entirely clear. But clearly, Shesh Bazaar is the, the prince of Judah, and which probably indicates that he was ro of royal descent, i.e. a descendant of David. And we know for certain that, that, that Zerubbabel was the grandson of Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, uh, a descendant of David. And, but Zerubbabel was never crowned as king, neither were any of the other descendants of Jehoiakim in fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Let me read this one. I don't think I've put it up, but this is Jeremiah 36, 30. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. It's actually, it may, it may seem uh, insignificant, but it's actually a tremendous prophecy uh, of that, 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 is, that is in Jeremiah. Uh, that's Jeremiah 36, 30. Uh, if you're interested, I actually did a thought for the day on this um, on the 26th of February this year and went into a bit more detail about it in three minutes. Um, so the next king of Jesus after Jehoiakim really was, sorry, the next king of Israel. Yeah, sorry, Sarah's trying to correct me and keep me on track. The next king of Israel was Jesus, although, of course, he was never crowned on this earth except with a crown of, of thorns. So Shesh Bazaar comes up in this passage. He's mentioned twice in verses 8 to 11. He's also in chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, which actually says the same as it says in this passage. It's just a repeat of it. Um, that is that Shesh Bazaar was given stuff for the temple and so on by Cyrus. But chapter 5 also adds that Shesh Bazaar laid the foundation of the temple. And if you look at verse 11, we get to eventually, but if you've got your Bibles open, it says that Shesh Bazaar brought the captives from Babylon to Jerusalem. But as we just read in chapter 2, verse 2, it says that Zerubbabel brought the people uh, back. So it does seem that um, Shesh Bazaar could be Zerubbabel. But what also appears to be the case is that Shesh Bazaar is only used when referring to official Persian action. So anyway, if you're interested in this, you can look into it more. Uh, some, some people think that Shesh Bazaar was an old, old man who was in charge and when the captives came back and then of course he, he died and then he, he left Zerubbabel in charge and so on. And so the, the, the thing is, does it, does it matter? Well, yes and no. History definitely matters. I mean, if it were ever the case that the, the Bible history were proved to be false, uh, the Bible would lose its, its credibility. But praise God, uh, history always proves that the Bible to be correct. Because, of course, it's the word of God. Right, we're on to the last verses here then. That's 9 to 11. This is the number of them. So these are the articles that they're bringing back. 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these Shesh Bazaar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. So it's just a list of the stuff that was brought from brought back to Jerusalem. And all the items are listed there. As we read, 30 gold plat uh, platters, uh, 1,000 silver platters, and so on. Now, I'm sure as I was reading it and you were reading it on the screen or in your Bible that you were adding it all together and you noticed the discrepancy here <clears throat> because th those items add up to 2,499. But it says there in verse 11 um, that all the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. And so is this a case of them, somebody not concentrating enough during math classes at school so they couldn't do arithmetic well and, and so on? But I, don't, I think probably not because uh, after all, Mithridath was the, the, the treasurer in Persia and the Persia was the, the world empire, if you like. And 
one would hope that he had at least some competence, competence in, in, in arithmetic. And so the answer is simply that we don't know why there is a discrepancy, um, but it isn't incorrect. I mean, what, what, uh, what many people think is that they just listed the important things and then gave us the total, and that seems fair enough. But for me, I don't know if you find all these details very boring and, and so on, but I like all these details because it shows that the Bible is a real book. The Bible is not a fudged book. It, it, nobody's gone through and edited all the apparent discrepancies out. They're all just there. It is, it is what it is. So there aren't actually uh, contradictions. There may be apparent contradictions, but there aren't actually. There may, there may be some things that we can't work out, but it, 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 it's, it, it shows that the Bible is a, it, it's a, it's a real account. It's real history and, and so on. Okay, anyway, they had to carry that lot back to um, Israel. So what, what, what do we learn from this Ezra chapter one? Well, the first thing I think is that God is, is well able to use even pagan rulers to bring about his purposes. I pointed out that Cyrus knew quite a lot from scripture. He knew about God, he knew about the Jews, he knew about Jerusalem, he knew about free will offerings and so on, but also that he himself seemed to be a Marduk worshiper and God used him to be to, to fulfill his purposes. God is well able to use whoever to, to bring about his purposes and that's, that gives us tremendous confidence when we we think about the world anytime, but the world today and so on. God is working his purpose about, never mind what all these other rulers think they're doing. The second thing is that we learn what we need to do. We learn what we need to know from scripture. The Lord is able to teach people, teach anyone. He taught Cyrus, um, teach anyone what they need to know through the scriptures. And in particular, of course, the scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. The, the third thing we learn is that scripture is accurate and exact. God's word can be trusted. His promises can, can be trusted. Now, that, that, that is obviously, uh, it's, it's a choice we make. It's, a, it's an issue of faith. I mean, I remember year, years ago, I decided to believe the Bible because the people who most impressed me on this earth were people who believed the Bible. So I, I simply made a choice. It turns out it was the right, it was the right choice, and so on. Um, but all, all of this is not merely an academic exercise. Uh, truly learning something from Scripture will always lead to action. That's what we. We, we, we learn in this chapter. For Cyrus, it led him to give the command for the Jews to return to Jerusalem and for the temple to be built. And for the Jews, they had to get up, leave their comfortable lives and go to Jerusalem. Uh, and or they had, they had to give free will offerings for the, the, the temple. And of course, this, this is another thing we learned that this, this giving is is very fundamental to spiritual life. I, I believe that a follower of Jesus learns very quickly to give in every way. We give to the Lord. We give him thanks. We give him praise. We give him worship. We're generous in our attitude towards others rather than cynical and critical and so on. And we're, we're, we're generous with our, with our money and, and material things. God's People, God's true people are, are givers. That's who they are. And of course, that is what love is. Uh, love is giving. Okay, so very quickly, uh, we're just going to start chapter two. And chapter two actually is, is almost all just lists of names of the people who went with Zerubbabel and, and Joshua to Jerusalem in about five three six bc it's actually quite an exciting chapter well at least i think it is 
Um, but we won't really get onto the excitement until next week. Um, so there, are, they, they, as we know, there are lots of names in the Bible, uh, lots, lots of lists of names, and especially in 1 and 2 Chronicles and in Ezra and Nehemiah. So why, why are there all these lists of names? Well, again, God is showing us that we're reading, we're reading about real people and real events. We are, we are reading history. We are reading facts. And it's potentially verifiable history. For example, th th those who were reading this at the time, if they had the resources, they could have verified these things and discredited it if it was not, um, not true. It's, it's the same reason, I think, that Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, and at one time he was the Lord Jesus in his resurrection was seen above 500 brethren. Well, at that time, and he also goes on to say most of whom are still alive. At that time, people have got, could have gone around and quizzed those people. This is, this is history, and that's a tremendous uh, thing, isn't it? And, of course, then for us, uh, we're, not, we're not around at that time, but when artifacts turn up and so on during archaeological digs, um, it, it, it verifies the history. But, of course, there's much that uh, has not been verified and by archaeology and so on, and it, do it doesn't matter. I mean, if I, when I think about my own life, I, I know nothing, zero, about my great-grandparents. So <clears throat> I might be tempted to believe they never existed because <laughs> I've got no evidence whatsoever. I know nothing about them. <laughs> but of course, that would be daft to, to, to think that. Um, the fact I know nothing about them doesn't mean they didn't exist or it didn't happen and so on. But we, we thank God that um, the fact that so much of the Bible has been verified, it encourages us to believe the, the, whole, the whole Bible if we need that sort of encouragement. But the the main encouragement to believe the Bible comes from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God will persuade us to uh, believe the Bible. After all, he knows it's all true because he, he wrote it. You know, the other religions, they have their myths, they have their legends. They don't tend to have history, but the scripture is full of history, and that's tremendous. Um, <clears throat> but... At the same time, you have to deal with, with problems. At least some people do, especially perhaps if you're going to be a Bible teacher. For example, Nehemiah 7 also, I don't know if, you, if, you, if you've got your Bible, if you, if you keep your finger in, in Ezra 2 and turn over to Nehemiah 7 and look at verse 6, and it's actually the same as Ezra chapter 2. So uh, the, the author of Nehemiah, who probably was Ezra, years and years later, 80 years later, he is compiling a list. And he said in verse 6, these are the people of the province who came back from the, the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his city, those who came with Zerubbabel, the Joshua, Nehemiah, and so on, the people we read in chapter 2 um, of Ezra. And the, the two lists are very nearly identical, uh, at least the bits I've checked. Now, I haven't checked it all. But there are a few uh, discrepancies. Now, I think I've... Let me see if it's worked here. Uh, right, should have shown you that. Yes, here it is. So this is, this is the beginning of... Ezra 2, and this is Nehemiah 7. So, so, so those who came with Zerubbabel were Joshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rehemiah. Those who came with Zerubbabel were Joshua, Nehemiah, Sarah, Realeah, Mordecai, Mordecai, and so on. Okay, there's actually one extra name here. And you can see some of the names are slightly different. Well, that happens. Um, so that's not, a, that's not a big deal. And then it starts, verse 3, for example, the people of Parosh, 2,172. Nehemiah 7, the sons of Parosh, 2,172. So that's very good. Verse 4, the people of Shephatiah, 372. 
Verse 9 in Nehemiah 7. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. That's all very good. The people of Arar, 775. The sons of Arar, 652. So there's a discrepancy. The, the people of Pehath Moab, the people of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812. The sons of Pehath Moab, the sons of Jeshua, 2,818. <laughs> Somebody is six out. <laughs> The people of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Elam, 1,254. I think you, you, get, you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> my, this one here, my uh, New, New International Study Version Study Bible tells me that about 20% of the numbers in these two lists are different. So 80% are the same, 20% are different. So what do we say about that? Well, there's, there's several things which we say can say about it, I think. Number one is that it's astonishing how accurate these lists are where com when compared to each other. Uh, number two, these discrepancies do not undermine the infallibility and inerrancy of scripture. So those words just mean that the Bible is, is always correct about everything it asserts. Number three, there are a few copyists errors in the Bible texts we have today. We, we obviously don't have any original texts. Uh, no doubt in the original text there weren't any discrepancies. We only have copies which are thousands of years old and have been copied many times, copy to copy to copy to copy to copy and so on. Okay, the, the next thing is that they probably used a, a sort of cipher notation, a system for counting. So something like you have vertical strokes for tens or units or horizontal strokes for tens or the other, other way around. And when you, when you have that sort of system, it's very easy to get lost and make minor mistakes in your counting. It's much easier than in our counting system. So what's amazing to me is that there aren't actually more uh, mistakes. But once again, to me, this, this whole thing only shows the, the validity of the Bible. Somebody hasn't gone through it and edited out all these apparent um, dis discrepancies. Uh, because if there were no, none of these in the, in, in the Bible, that, that would surely be an argument that the, that the text is, is, is a fraud. It's been, it's been fudged because you can imagine that, that, that no matter how careful you are, copying uh, such a huge document so many times, there's got to be some copious errors somewhere. But as I say, what's, what's remarkable is how few of these errors there are. And of course, that is a testimony to the great respect the Jews had for the word of God. The, the scribes knew they were copying God's own words and they were in awe of it. So they developed systems, I'm not going to go into this, but they developed systems which would minimize and almost eradicate copying errors. So the fifth thing I'm going to say is that <clears throat> these discrepancies make absolutely no difference whatsoever to the message of the Bible, and it makes no difference whether there were uh, 775 or 652. Um, God's message to mankind is very clear. The, 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 it, it's it's uh, from beginning to end of the Bible. And the, the sixth thing I'm going to say is that it's amazing to me that the Lord chose to give us his word in this way in a way in which so much could have gone wrong. So much was dependent on frail human beings and them not making mistakes. Um, and yet the Bible has come down to us, God's own word has come down to us, now translated into so many languages worldwide and distributed all, all over the world, uh, in, all, in an almost perfect state. It's astonishing, isn't it? Human weakness has not hindered God's purpose at all. And I think there's a, there's a huge message here. God's purpose will be fulfilled. 
despite human weakness, despite even corruption and frailty and so on. God's will will be done. I think I've got a verse here. The Lord said to, to Paul, um, my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's amazing, isn't it? And I think the Bible is a great example of that. For thousands of years, the, 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 the Bible has been transforming uh, individuals, families, communities, sometimes whole nations. And yet the potential for it to have gone all wrong was huge when we consider all the, the human connections. So the Lord allowed his word to be transmitted by and through fallen human beings. And of course, that's how he still works. He still testifies through frail human beings. It's just, it's just astonishing. It's amazing. It's a wonder, isn't it? And so I think we, we can be encouraged that in all, in all our frailty, he will get us to the end of our journey in the way he, uh, he has purposed he has purpose to. Um, that's his purpose. It's his design. It is his will. Our part, as we've seen in this chapter one, is to bring our free will offering, to yield to him, to present our bodies as living sacrifices to him. Amen. I've finished. Let me, let me just pray. Lord, we do praise you again. Praise you today for your word. Praise you for your speaking. Praise you that you are bringing about your purposes. You used Cyrus, Lord. You used all these uh, Jewish scribes and so on to, to bring us scriptures. And we praise you, Lord, for such a wonderful work. And we're encouraged today that you take us up as well. And it's, it's your might that is going to work out your purpose. Nothing, nothing in us whatsoever. And it's your... It's you who is going to be glorified. So again, we come and bring our free will offering to you. We offer ourselves to you, Lord, and uh, present our bodies a living sacrifice. We thank you for the privilege that we can. Amen. Okay, that's how I finished.